Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to another video about bizarre cases of people who faked their deaths. We decided that since there were so many great stories to choose from, we wanted to cover as many as possible, and decided to make this video to accompany today's other upload. If you haven't seen the first three cases we covered, be sure to check those out as well. We'll leave a link in the description below. While you're there, if you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, here are three more bizarre stories of people who faked their deaths. From an outsider's perspective, 38-year-old Marcus Schrenker was living a life that many people would envy. He wore expensive suits, drove expensive cars, owned a motorcycle, and even had two planes. His multi-million dollar home in the affluent Indianapolis suburb of Geist was palatial. The 10,000 square foot property was right on the water and featured a boat dock and swimming pool. Despite owning three insurance and investment consulting firms that paid for his lavish lifestyle, Schrenker was known in his neighborhood as a family man. He and his wife, Michelle, hosted extravagant parties known for including dazzling fireworks displays, and Schrenker was always opening his home to any of the friends of his three children that wanted to come by. In fact, for a man that was running three successful companies, some people noticed that Schrenker seemed to have an awful lot of time on his hands. He would regularly plow driveways for neighbors in the winter, and was also known to spend countless hours working and hanging out in his yard. Some said it was like he didn't have a job at all. While speculation about Schrenker's employment status turned out to be incorrect, those who were skeptical about his so-called perfect life would ultimately be proven right. It turned out that there was another side to Schrenker, one that those close to him, and those unlucky enough to do business with him, knew all too well. Despite claiming that he was happily married, Schrenker had actually been cheating on Michelle with a woman who worked at the airport where he kept his planes for some time. As the relationship between Schrenker and Michelle deteriorated, he became volatile and angry. At the same time, there were multiple accusations against Schrenker and his companies, accusing him of defrauding clients and swindling them out of money. Several people came forward with the same story. Schrenker would ingratiate himself with a family, get them to invest with him, and then betray them. In January of 2008, the Indiana Department of Insurance filed a complaint against Schrenker on behalf of seven different investors, claiming that he had cost them more than $250,000 by failing to tell them that they would face high fees for switching annuities. Though Schrenker continued on like nothing was wrong, lawsuits against him and his companies started to pile up. Schrenker's entire life would finally collapse in the span of just a few days at the end of 2008, beginning on December 30th, when Michelle filed for divorce. The next day, Schrenker's Indiana State Financial Advisor license expired, and all three of his companies and his home were searched in connection with the ongoing investigations into his shady business practices. Several days later, on January 9th, a judge ordered one of Schrenker's companies to pay more than $530,000 to a Maryland insurance company because of problems with insurance and annuity plans that Schrenker's company was selling. This was on the heels of another lawsuit by a different company that was trying to get back $1.4 million in commissions it had paid to Schrenker for other insurance and annuity policies he had sold. It was at this point that Schrenker decided it was time to take extreme measures to try and get himself out of the mess that he'd created. On January 10th, 2009, Schrenker traveled to Harpersville, Alabama in a pickup truck that was carrying his motorcycle. Inside the bike's saddlebags, he had stashed money and supplies. Schrenker left the motorcycle at a storage facility in Harpersville, telling the owner he'd be back in a couple of days to pick it up. The next day, Schrenker got into his turboprop single-engine Piper Meridian plane and took off from an airfield in Anderson, Indiana. He was scheduled to fly to Destin, Florida. However, near Birmingham, Alabama, he made a distress call to air traffic control, telling them that his windshield had imploded and that he was, quote, bleeding profusely. Schrenker then set the aircraft to autopilot and parachuted out. 
While it's not clear exactly how Schranker expected things to play out from here, what's definitely true is that he wanted the plane to crash and for everyone to think that he was on board. Some have speculated that he planned for his plane to crash into the Gulf of Mexico, where the inability to recover his body wouldn't have seemed as suspicious. However, this is not what happened. Instead, military jets were quickly dispatched to intercept Schrenker's plane. When they caught up to the small aircraft, they immediately noticed that the door was wide open and the cockpit was empty. The plane was followed roughly 200 miles until it crashed less than 100 yards from a residential area in Milton, Florida. As authorities inspected the crash site, they not only failed to find Schrenker's body, but also couldn't find any blood or signs that the windshield had imploded like Schrenker had claimed during his distress call. What authorities did find on board were a United States Atlas and a National Campground Directory, both of which had the sections for Florida and Alabama ripped out. Needless to say, this was not ideal for Schrenker, who was hoping everyone would believe that he had died in the staged crash. After parachuting safely to the ground in Alabama, Schrenker eventually made his way to Harpersville and picked up his motorcycle. He then rode to a KOA campground in Quincy, Florida, where he didn't give a name and paid for a single-night campsite in cash. On January 12th, knowing that authorities were actively looking for him and that he was likely screwed, Schrenker emailed a friend of his back in Indiana, asking him to clear up what he said were misunderstandings surrounding the plane crash. In the email, he reportedly claimed that the windshield really had imploded, and that he was suffering from hypoxia when he parachuted out of the plane, and that the condition had been responsible for the bad decisions he had made. For those not familiar with the term, hypoxia is a state in which oxygen is not available in sufficient amounts to body tissue. It can happen for a variety of reasons, but in this case would have happened because of cabin depressurization at a high altitude, where there was a lower concentration of oxygen available. Or rather, that would have been the case if Schrenker was telling the truth, but he was not. After receiving the email, Schrenker's friend handed it over to authorities, and they were able to roughly locate him using the information it contained. At the same time, the owners of the campground where Schrenker was staying became suspicious after noticing that he had failed to check out, and that the outer flap of his tent had a large red stain on it, they contacted authorities, who at roughly 10 p.m. on January 13th descended on the campsite and found Schrenker inside his tent, barely conscious and suffering from self-inflicted knife wounds. Though Schrenker had lost a lot of blood, he was taken to the hospital and eventually stabilized. In 2009, Schrenker pled guilty to several charges related to staging his death, including for the dangerous way he destroyed his aircraft and the fact that he had caused a U.S. Coast Guard response when no help was needed. Two months later, he was sentenced to four years and three months in prison, and was ordered to pay more than $900,000 in combined restitution to the Coast Guard and to the lien holders of the plane he destroyed. He would eventually reach an additional deal with prosecutors in Indiana, and plead guilty to five counts of securities fraud, for which he was sentenced to ten years, to run consecutively with his previous sentence. He was also ordered to pay the victims of his crimes more than $630,000. In 2008, 62-year-old William Groth was a successful attorney that lived with his wife in the Nashville area. He worked for a company that collected royalties for songwriters in the city's historic Music Row district, and by all accounts, appeared to be living a perfectly normal life. However, all of that would change on November 19th of that year, when he disappeared completely out of the blue. When investigators began their search for William, they almost immediately made a series of alarming discoveries. That evening, his Blackberry, jewelry, and credit cards were found tied up in a plastic bag on the lawn of a home on South 5th Street. Around the same time, his Honda Civic was discovered in Shelby Park, near the Cumberland River boat ramp. His wallet and hat were on the riverbank, and his jacket was in the river. More frantic searches followed, involving ground crews, helicopters, and divers in the rivers, but no more traces of William could be found. Many began to fear that he had drowned, 
and foul play couldn't be ruled out either. Several days later, on November 24th, the case took an even darker turn when an unknown man contacted Nashville's Emergency Communications Center. The man claimed that he had killed William Groth accidentally during a robbery and wanted to call to confess. However, as detectives continued to investigate William's disappearance, they started to become suspicious. In particular, it seemed strange that each piece of evidence they had recovered on the day that William went missing was found with some form of ID. It was almost like whoever had left the items there wanted police to know they belonged to William and follow a trail. It turned out that this is exactly what had happened. The evidence had been planted by William himself in an attempt to fool authorities into thinking that he was dead so he could collect on a $1 million life insurance policy he had taken out. Further investigation soon revealed that in the days after William's disappearance, he had fled to a motel in Missoula, Montana, where he checked in under his wife's maiden name. Voice analysis of the call that authorities received on November 24th revealed that it was William who had made it. He had posed as his killer in order to throw police off. William was finally tracked down two months later in January of 2009, after his family notified police that he had checked himself into a medical facility for a mental health evaluation in Arizona. He was later released and charged for trying to defraud his insurance company. When the case went to court, William's defense argued that he was suffering from depression and that his decision to commit the crime had happened after he stopped taking his medication. William said that he didn't tell anyone about his plans, not even his wife, and had acted normally with her right up until the time he disappeared. He said that for most of the time he was on the run, he had lived in a tent in the desert in Arizona. William eventually accepted a plea agreement and was given a three-year sentence for his crime. He was also ordered to pay restitution to the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department for the resources they used while searching for him, which they estimated to be in the range of $11,000. In September of 1995, it seemed that tragedy had struck the Kongsiri family of Palmer Township, Pennsylvania. While husband and wife Lee and Facha were on vacation in their native Thailand, Lee had suffered a heart attack and had died. Lee was only 57 years old and was barely two years into his retirement after leaving the industrial equipment manufacturing company where he had worked for most of his professional life. Lee's wife Facha chalked her husband's early death up to too much drinking and womanizing, though dutifully handled his funeral arrangements in Thailand before returning to the United States. When Facha arrived home, she got to work collecting on the life insurance policies that had been taken out on her husband. At first, everything seemed to be in order. She produced a death certificate and a death of American citizen abroad report. Facha also showed the insurance companies receipts for Lee's funeral expenses, which included costs for a temple, as well as monks who had performed chants and blessings for several days following Lee's death. The costs also included a rental boat, which had been used to take Lee's cremated remains out to be spread at sea. In total, there were nine life insurance policies taken out on Lee Kong Siri, of which seven paid out benefits to Facha, totaling more than $1.5 million. However, two of the insurance companies, all stayed in Prudential, started to become suspicious about Lee's death and refused to pay the claims. Instead, they began an investigation, theorizing that Facha might have committed insurance fraud. In the meantime, Facha moved back to Thailand permanently. One of the first red flags that the companies noticed was the sheer number of policies Facha had taken out on her husband. It was soon discovered that she had far exceeded the $200,000 cap on outside policies from other insurance companies, which she had agreed to in the terms of her policy with Allstate. The insurance companies also found out that Facha had been represented by numerous lawyers for these different policies. Then, there was the fact that though Facha's adult son Michael Kongsiri was listed as the beneficiary of one of the two unpaid policies, she refused to let representatives from the company talk to him insisting that she was handling things. When the insurance companies were finally able to contact Michael, he told them that he hadn't spoken to his parents in years and that he didn't want anything to do with whatever was going on. 
However, the most damning piece of evidence against Facha came after the insurance companies were able to obtain a videotape showing her and Lee meeting the parents of their son's wife at the Bangkok airport. The tape was taken in the fall of 1996, a full year after Lee was supposed to have died. The insurance companies handed over the information to U.S. authorities, and a proper criminal investigation began. Though it was now apparent that Facha and Lee Kong Siri had faked Lee's death to defraud their insurance companies, over the course of the investigation, authorities made a shocking discovery. This wasn't the first time the Kong series had done this. It turned out that 10 years before they faked Lee's death, the Kong series had faked Facha's death in almost exactly the same way. Prior to 1985, Facha actually went by the name Silivai Kong Siri. That year, she went on an extended trip to Thailand, and according to available records, had died while overseas. When investigators spoke with those that knew the Kong series, they recalled that their children spent a lot of time alone, and that Lee and Silivai never seemed to be around. Parents of one of their daughter's best friends recalled Lee acting strangely while his wife was away in Thailand, not even letting his daughter speak to her on the phone when she would call. Eventually, they remembered him telling them and his daughter that her mother had died. However, what had actually happened during this time was that the Kong series were busy forging the death certificates and associated paperwork to make it look like Silivai had died overseas. Once the insurance companies had paid out hundreds of thousands in life insurance money, Silivai returned to the family home in Pennsylvania under the new name of Facha. Facha married Lee again under this new name, and he referred to her as his second wife. They were careful not to make any contact with anyone who would have known Facha from before, and the Kong Siri children were instructed to refer to her from that point on as their stepmother. News of the Kong Siri's wild scheme finally made its way out to the public in January of 1999, when U.S. authorities announced that a state grand jury in Pennsylvania found that there was enough evidence to bring charges against them. Though the statute of limitations had expired on the Kong series' 1985 insurance scam, they were charged with nine counts of insurance fraud, seven counts of theft by deception, two counts of attempted theft by deception, and one count of criminal conspiracy for the crimes associated with Lee's fake death. Though the charges had been laid, there was still the matter of the Kong series' extradition from Thailand. Not only that, but Thai authorities were having a hard time tracking Lee and Facha down. By this point, they were under investigation for crimes they had committed in Thailand, and had assumed new identities and were moving around the country to avoid detection. Finally, after 11 months, Lee and Facha were arrested. The Kong series would eventually be extradited to the United States in early 2001, where they would go on trial for their crimes. In June of that year, they pled guilty to numerous charges, and were each given a sentence of 7 to 14 years in state prison. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.